um, since since it's, um, Mr. Smith trees, is trees. Since Mr. Smith is traveling today unavoidably, um, as vice chair, I'm going to call this meeting to order. I believe it's right at two o'clock. Welcome everyone, and um, we would ask Mr. Glenn if he would pray over us today. Our kind Heavenly Father, we thank you for the many blessings of life and the gift of life itself. We thank you for the community and county in which we're privileged to live. We thank you for our college and those that are willing to give their time and energy to serve on its behalf. Thank you, Father, for the many blessings of our resources of this past year. We ask your guidance and divine direction on our college and the freshness of the new year. These things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Mr. Glenn. If you will <coughs> stand and we'll do the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United, United States, States of America. Of America. And to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. <coughs> the next item on, on our agenda is open forum. Crystal, <coughs> do we have anybody? No, ma'am. All right. So... We will hear the President's report, Dr. Farmer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair and members of the Weatherford College Board of Trustees, I would like to give a few brief recognitions, employment notifications, and an enrollment report. Recognitions. The first recognition of the meeting is to Dr. Scott Tarno Novesky, Kim Kelly, Lisa Martin, Julie Moeller, and Nick Pugh. Through their collective efforts, many WC students registered to vote for the first time, and many others updated their registration addresses. Would you please stand to be recognized for your efforts? Thank you for helping our students to become responsible citizens. <laughs> Several of our trustees recently attended a ceremony at the beautiful Steinway Hall Fort Worth facility. Steinway and Sons flew in corporate executives from New York to officially recognize Weatherford College as an all Steinway institution. Weatherford College is only the sixth community college in Texas to receive this designation. WC beat universities like Baylor, Texas Tech, and the University of North Texas in the race to become an all Steinway institution. The impact on recruiting and institutional reputation has been immediate and will continue to be profound. It is my pleasure at this time to present the official plaque uh, representing Weatherford College as an all Steinway institution to the Weatherford College Board of Trustees. Thank you for your support. <laughs> it really is beautiful and it's just and it was a lovely occasion plus our students played those pianos it was you want to pass it up and down or <laughs> thank you sir thank you congratulations to the Weatherford College Foundation the Weatherford yeah. College Foundation recently passed the 10 million dollar mark in net assets Foundation assets went from $8.6 million in December of 2018 to $10.3 million in December of 2019, a gain of $1.7 million. Thank you to Foundation President Bob Glenn, our Foundation Board, and to all of our generous donors. What a year. Our Weatherford College athletic teams are on fire. Weatherford College basketball has a 21-4 overall record and a 9-2 conference record. The men's basketball is 15-10 overall and 3-6 and in conference. Baseball is 7-1 and, and nationally ranked at number 17 in the nation. Yeah. And softball remains solid at 4-2. and two. 
Several former Coyotes recently competed in the Fort Worth Stock Show and Rodeo. WC Rodeo alumnus Martha Angelone won $8,000 last Saturday night in the finals. Meanwhile, current rodeo tie-down roper Thane Lockhart was champion at the San Antonio Stock Show and Rodeo. The Coyote Rodeo team is positioning for another strong showing at the College National Finals Rodeo in Casper, Wyoming this summer. Great things are happening across the board in Weatherford College Athletics. It's a great time to be a coyote. Employee notices. DMAC Local requires the college president to provide the names of contract employees that have resigned since the last board meeting. In accordance with this policy, the following individuals have submitted resignations. Merlin Coleman, our fine arts instructor, has announced her retirement effective May 9th, 2020. Uh, Jennifer Crocker, a respiratory care instructor, has resigned effective 514. Jessica Hess, an instructor in nursing, has resigned with an effective date of January 27th, 2020. And Rebecca Spikes has resigned from her coordinator of testing services position effective 123, 2020. Merlin Coleman is retiring after an unprecedented 50 years of service to Weatherford College. We will be having a special ceremony in her honor later this spring. We thank Merlin, Jennifer, Jessica, and Rebecca for their service and wish them well in future endeavors. <coughs> Enrollment report. As of the spring 2020 semester census date, we ended up with a system-wide spring enrollment of 5,523 students. This is a slight decrease of 375 students year to date, primarily resulting from our change in our technical dual credit policy. <coughs> Overall, the Weatherford campus experienced minor enrollment increases, while all other campuses experienced minor enrollment decreases. Our enrollment management strategy is successfully resulting in the, in the desired increased financial health. Madam Chair, that concludes the President's report. Thank you, sir. This brings us to uh, agenda item number four, which is the consent agenda. And it has been our practice in, in the recent past to uh, ask that, that uh, the board approve all four of the items in the consent agenda as, as requiring just one motion. Um, do I hear such a motion? I so move. I second it. And a second? I second. The motion has been made and seconded. Uh, all approve? Aye. Aye. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, agenda item number five uh, is a consideration and possible action, workforce and emerging technologies building and that will fall to Mr. Curley. Thank you very much. We've made uh, good progress. The efforts to determine the size and scope and purpose of the building has been underway. Our uh, architects have been very diligent in gathering the data and reducing it to spreadsheets, <coughs> and we have responded to those spreadsheets. And the uh, the size of the building has ended up being somewhere around 60,000 square feet. And uh, that came down from their first swing at it from 100,000 square feet, which uh, we immediately said, no, we're not going to do that. So, uh, but it's working very nicely, and we're getting the programs that need to be there incorporated into the building. We've also, you know, part of that process is arranging the relationship between the various stakeholders, how, they're, how the building fits together, making good progress on that. We have uh, finished our space analysis and like I said, it, it turns out to be about 60,000 square feet. We have both the demolition and the CMAR that are out for bids. We've had the first round of advertising. We'll get to the second. And when you get back to the next meeting, we will have the contracts to bring to you for your approval. That means that we'll be ready to take down the council building and we'll be ready to bring the 
CMAR into our operation, which means that we can get an official estimate of the size and the cost of the building as we go forward. We've also made progress on arranging for the financing of the building. Uh, and I think today we'll have a presentation that give you some idea of how that's shaping up. Some of the things that, that would be important to us is the fact that we will bring our local banking community into the process so that they can have a uh, sort of a preferred position from which to bid and take parts of the, uh, of the offering that we will have with a revenue bond. So those are the things that are going on and uh, we're getting uh, good traction and I think we're going to end up with a really wonderful <coughs> building. So any questions that you have? Any questions, board members? Okay, that's, that's my <coughs> report. And, and we'll hear at the next board meeting about the demolition. We, yes, we will have a contract okay. in hand and we know what it's going to cost and when it's going to happen. Yeah. And we'll have also have the CMAR in hand when we uh, talk to you next. Because the Weatherford Fire Department, I understand, has done some work toward that end. Happily. And they're training good. Okay, thank you, Mr. Curley. Okay, now uh, the next item is six consideration of possible action facilities naming. Dr. Cantrell, Andra. On a somber note, on November the 25th, 2015, longtime agriculture instructor, rodeo coach, and friend to all, Mike Brown lost his life in an unfortunate accident doing what he loved best, riding and roping. Due to this loss to our student body and the entire college community, there has been many to express desire to memorialize him on our campus. As I walked through the halls a minute ago of the academic building and looked at what we were recommending, I came across a framed picture of Mike. The mat had been hand-tooled, and it was one of the students, one of the at, at rodeo uh, kids that he had taught. And it told me right then, I thought, he was more than just an instructor to these kids. They loved him. Yeah, and I too. think they've done their part and I think now it's, it's a good time for us to remember Mike. It is my great pleasure and honor at this time that I represent the President's Cabinet and many others in recommending that we name the North Wing of the four, first floor of the acad academic building the Mike Brown Wing. Right. This area now includes agriculture classes as well as displays celebrating agriculture and rodeo. We are in the process of adding murals to that area and dressing it up more to be proper in remembering, remembering Mike. As a follow-up to this naming, in addition, the cabinet would like to recommend naming the agriculture building the police and maintenance building. <laughs> agriculture is no longer housed in that building as the WC Police Department have moved into the space. As an additional piece of information for the board, the college will now begin referring to the Jim and Belayda Boyd Technology Building as simply the Jim and Belayda Boyd Building, or Boyd Building for short. The building uses have expanded beyond technology since the board named the facility approximately 20 years ago. If approved today to name the building the Wing, Mike Brown Wing, we will be in process of working with the Brown family and the Weatherford College family in planning a dedication in the near future. At this time, I officially recommend to the board, we recommend that the board name the North Wing of the first floor of the academic building, the Mike Brown Wing, and the former agriculture building, the police and maintenance building. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Do I hear such a motion? I'll make that motion. Thank you, Trev. Second. Thank you. Motion has been made and seconded. All in favor say aye. Aye. The motion has passed. Thank you. Okay. Agenda item seven. 
Um, oh, we have the RBC Capital Markets update from Mr. Matt Bowles. I would like to introduce Mr. Matt Bowles. He's been with us before. He's with RBC Capital. He's handled many of our financing in the past. And so he would like to give you some scenarios of the financing on the new workforce building. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Glad to be back. It's uh, been two or three months, I think, since I was here last when we talked about the same financing for the same facility. And we have some updated numbers we want to cover here today. Am I driving? Am I driving? <laughs> yes. Okay. okay, so what we have done in just a, a form of an update is to run a couple of new scenarios for you with, with uh, different construction amounts. And let me say from the outset that our job, at least initially, is to walk you through the different scenarios that are available to the college and to lay out in a very transparent way um, how we can go about financing this. In regards to this actual finance plan, we are looking at revenue bonds. Um, our obvious goal at the end of the day is to make sure that we deliver this financing at the lowest cost to you, so the lowest possible interest rate to you. So that could ultimately mean as we progress through the process that you sell these bonds to the open public or to a local bank. We just at this point don't have those questions answered. But I do want you to know that as we get down the line, that will be part of my job to make sure that we do. For you, what we should be doing is your fiduciary, and that is to sell the bonds at the lowest cost of interest. So understand that. Understand that this is focused primarily on the use of revenue bonds which will be repaid from revenues that come from the actual facility and those operations. So just wanted to give you a little backdrop there. What we contemplate here in the summary, we've got all sorts of assumptions that we make, and as usual, we always use conservative estimates around every assumption that we deploy in these scenarios so that when the actual financing is done, we don't come back over budget. Over budget, my business is out of business, so we don't like to do that. Um, we focus here on the second bullet point on two separate scenarios, one for $18 million and one for $20 million. I heard when I was walking in a brief summary, a synopsis of the square footage of the building and the possible cost of that building. You obviously won't have a guaranteed maximum price on the building until you get more information, which will be presented in your March meeting. And I will be back at that meeting to fine-tune this analysis and make sure that it matches up with those guaranteed maximum price uh, numbers that are listed in the contract presented to the board. But in this particular case, we chose a range, 18 million and 20 million. Um, we are contemplating the issuance of these obligations here in the summer uh, with the planned completion of the facility on or about August of 2021. The college enjoys um, a good underlying credit rating of A+, plus, but will probably purchase bond insurance, which would get them to a double A. You would only purchase that insurance if it was economically advantageous to the college, so that's yet again another analysis we'll do, but we're going ahead and making that assumption at this point. Um, and as it, you look at the last bullet there, we've used interest rates from the first week in this month, plus a quarter of a point, so 25 basis points, and let me just say that if you read the papers or watched any sort of financial news of late, uh, the tax-exempt municipal market is yet again, and I've been saying this a long time, so it's getting old, but yet again at all-time lows in terms of borrowing cost. It's just absolutely a phenomenal time to be an issuer of bonds if you have projects that you need to finance. So on to the scenario. Scenario one is the $18 million. Scenario two is the $20 million. For each of those scenarios, we have sub-scenarios. 20-year payback, 25-year payback, and a 30-year payback. So they're both consistent with one another, just differing payback periods and amounts. And then we jump right into what will eventually be a, re a repetition here of each of the scenarios. Scenario 1A is 18 million over 20 years. And I'm gonna walk through one of these and then we can quickly flip through the others because they all follow the same format. Again, this is 18 million over a 20-year period. If you look out to the far right hand side of this page, you can see what the payback schedule looks like. It's approximately one point, call it $1.2 million a year over that 20 year period. One thing that uh, I want to make 
uh, sort of clear to the board, I've had this conversation with your administration, is that um, the actual asset that you're financing is a brick and mortar asset um, that will clearly last 30 years. And so uh, part of what we try to make sure is that you don't mismatch an asset and a liability. In other words, if you were financing technology, I wouldn't suggest that you do it over 30 years. Yeah. Uh, nor would I suggest that if you're doing a brick and mortar asset, you finance it over five years. So there will be a point in time at which the board and the administration needs to make a decision on the payback period. A lot of yeah. that will have to do with the revenues that are coming from the project that drive the repayment of it. Um, but I just want you to know that we're not mismatching an asset and a liability here. 20 years would be very conservative. The left-hand side of the column's got all sorts of statistical information. Um, in my business, there are a million different ways to measure interest rates, but the one that I want to focus your attention to is all in PIC. It's about halfway down that chart on the top left-hand portion of this page. Think of that as the APR. This includes all the costs of doing the financing, the coupon rate on the bonds, uh, the time value of money that lapses as you repay the loan is 2.8, call it 2.84 percent, recognizing that 0.25 percent of that is cushioned. So it's it's somewhere closer to 2.6 percent if you sell the obligations today. And you can see at the bottom left-hand portion of the page, we fully fund a project fund of 18 million dollars, pay all the costs associated with issuing the bonds underwriters, the insurance, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so this is all in. And then if you go to the next page, this is scenario 1B. The only thing that has changed here is the payback period. We go from 20 to 25 years. So you can see that the payment drops to 1.06 million. The all-in TIC is just over 3%. And again, with the 25 basis points of cushion, it's just <coughs> under 3%. And then scenario 1C would be the 30-year payback period, which would get you to 975000 roughly on an annual payment basis. And the all-in TIC would be like 3.4%, but again, take the cushion out, it's 3.15% in that ballpark. Now, these are all the $18 million scenarios, so we've accumulated all the debt service for you on one nice, neat, concise page there, so you could refer back to that should you need to do that. And then we jump to the second set of scenarios where we analyze, again, a 20, 25, and 30 year payback period for a $20 million revenue bond issue. And the same format holds true here with respect to the initial three scenarios that we went through. In this particular case, the all in TIC is 2.85. So very consistent, again, with what we saw in the previous three scenarios. The uh, 20 million over 25 years is 1.18 million in payback. And then finally, the 25 year payback on a $20 million bond issue is 1.18 million. Um, and then we accumulate all that for you again on one <coughs> nice, concise, neat page. And so, we supply this for a number of reasons. One, we want you to have a barometer by which to understand what the college will need to generate to pay back the debt service on the bonds, because that is obviously influenced by the project and what the project may generate in terms of state monies and that sort of thing. And the other is just quite simply a planning tool so that as you go through the different options that you have with respect to what the building's like and what, how it's furnished and that sort of thing, you have a barometer um, hopefully to do some planning around what your wishes and desires and then what reality may be. So um, it's a very quick overview of what I have today. I'm glad to take questions. Again, I'll be back in March to see you, and I believe my agenda item will fall right after the contract. We can talk about specific amounts then, but I'm glad to walk you through the process or talk about the scenarios further if that should be your desire. Thank you. Are there questions? Are there? It it's, seems a short time when we were talking about this as sort of sort of a dream. You know, we could do this, and it's r real close now to becoming reality. We thank you for the information. We need it. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you very much. So decision making next month. Next month. Right. So now we're going to hear from Dr. Cantrell on proposed 2021 tuition and fees. Back in December, we started working uh, with the tuition and fee advisory committee and coming up with the new tuition and fees for the coming year. Uh, the administration, along with assistance of the Tuition Fee Advisory Committee, have researched and analyzed the current rates with other community colleges out there. And factors that we reviewed also with analysis was the anticipated budget for the coming year and what our needs were. The fact that the 2021 state appropriations would remain the same for this coming year over this year. Tuition and fee revenue supplements and other major revenue sources, primarily property taxes. Uh, changes in tuition and fees recommended based on these items uh, recommended for the coming year below are tuition rates for in-district students would increase by $6 per semester credit hour or 7%. When we look at last year, uh, we were at $89 a tuition hour. The state average at that time was 94 um, for this current year. We were definitely behind the average, which we feel like we need to raise that figure to support all the programs that we have uh, looking forward to going into the new workforce building and the other items to support the academic programs and workforce programs here at the college. The in-district, the out-of-district, tuition for out-of-district would increase by $13 semester credit hour or 9%. If you look at the out of district oh, with average, we were further behind there than we were with the in district. The out of district state average was 151 and we were at 143. So that would raise that to the in district or out of district would currently be at 156 recommended at. Tuition for out-of-district Wise County and Wise County students would increase by $9 per semester credit hour, or 8%. Tuition for out-of-district ECG students would increase by $12 per semester credit hour, or 9%. Out-of-state rates would also increase by $18 semester hour at 9%. The differential tuition rate for associate degree nursing programs would increase by $20 to $80. And then the, an RN to BSN program differential rate would be set at $80 to be comparable to the RN program. Uh, room and board charges will increase by $50 and that's really for board charge increase with the, the cost of food going up. <clears throat> Uh, due to the conversion to the new college system, we will not be able to continue with our current payment plan. We were um, charging $25, or Nelnet was paying $25, but we, with the new Aleutian colleague program, we're having to move to a touch net, which basically we're taking over that installment plan ourselves, so we, the cost of it. So we have chosen to remain at the $25, but we do have to set the fee of $25 per student per installment plan. Parking permits for the summer semester would simply be increased by would increase simply by increasing the fee for $30 for the entire summer instead of separate summer semesters of $20 each. I think we're going to a new semester three semesters now fall spring and summer so we're we're doing that to comply and it should save the student ten dollars with, with doing that a final recommendation will be made to the board in march after further consideration and review of the preliminary budget the re review of other community college proposed rate is also continuing at this point because many as we saw last year while we're raising they're also raising so we're just trying to stay at closely with that average where we can afford the programs and it it may come at times that we will 
increase above depending on the caliber of the programs and what we intend to do with those programs. Uh, are there any questions that you have at this time? I'd be glad to entertain those or if you have questions during the month before we pass those, please feel free to call my office. Now, of course, we always go in with looking at our scholarship programs, and we raise those scholarships to match the tuition increases and the cost of room and board there. That's always a good move. <laughs> any other questions? Any, any questions? Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you for that report. Okay, Mr. Indy. I'm going to present your pathways update, demand study update, and the vet tech program update. Try to blend these all together and go as quickly as we can. So we're going to highlight some items on each one for you. First, the pathways newsletter, which has detailed information about what we're doing, will come out March the 1st. Okay. Our next institute is April 22nd to 24th in Houston. If you're interested in attending, please let me or Shante Cibrano or Adam Finley will make arrangements. Otherwise, we'll report back to you after our April event. Dr. Linda Garcia, who is our Pathways Coach, will be here to speak with the college on March 12th and 13th of 2020. She'll be here at our board meeting. Good. and She'll give you a brief presentation about Pathways and where whether for college is at and how we compare to the rest of the state. We'll also have a wrap-up meeting with her at 9 a.m. on the 13th. That's Friday. So if you'd like to attend that, we'll make sure you have a place to show up and to see what we're talking about. She'll be meeting with other members of constituencies from the Pathways Task Forces. So we, we really look forward to that. I wanted to highlight some activities we've engaged in. We have two dozen task forces at work now, and we're at a various stages along the way, but we wanted to give you some highlights. The task force for the HOPE statement and the ADA statement are finished with their work, and those statements are now distributed for faculty to include in outlines and in syllabi. The Beacon Student Success Notification System, for those of you who are familiar with Early Alert, that's what that is, is now being deployed, and as of today at about noon, we had 136 active alerts. That isn't all the alerts we've had. Active alerts are the ones that are waiting for students to respond to them. So the system's been in operation since January, Jan about January 27th, and we've had hundreds of people notified and participating in this process. The good news is it's working. We're going to improve our student success and get more folks active in their classes and less alerts, hopefully, overall. The interdisciplinary conference that Dr. Tarnabieski has started last year through our social science department will be February 27th and 28th this year. Please attend if you're inclined and you have some time. It's a pretty exciting thing for our college to have that conference. Our task force on new student orientation is redesigning our new student orientation process for deployment this summer. We had a committee work on calculator use in college classes, most especially math classes. They are making their recommendation to the CASC, that's the Curriculum and Academic Standards Committee, and they'll do that for deployment of the new procedures this fall so that we'll know what calculators are used, when they're used, and how we're in concert with the Texas State Standards, especially as they were involved the testing standards. Where calculators are used on tests, we'll start applying them in classes. Where they're not, we'll explain they are not. And the last thing we'd like to talk to you about leading into the demand study is looking at a pass-fail option for college courses. It's a new task force aimed at improving student success, particularly in our gateway classes. So in that line, I'm going to talk to you about some numbers, and we're going to get to this as numbers with heart. Yes, please. I have a quick question. The, the follow-up meeting with Dr. Garcia will be where? I believe the we want to see how many people we're going to have attend. It may be in here so that we can get enough people involved. Well, one will come. With what? I will come. All right. We'll make sure you know where it is and we'll, we'll announce you. the location as soon as we have some idea. Of, I think we have to have a larger room than we had intended in the Welcome Center because we expect greater participation. Yeah. So we'll do that. As we look at demand study, there are a couple of things we're going to look at today. The first, as we've been promising, we looked at student success indicators. These are student pass rates in our courses in particular. We looked at everything, but in particular, we want to look at the co-requisites that we're now required to teach in mathematics. I want you to note that we had a 61% pass rate in Math 0332, and it's co-requisite in the fall only, 60% in Math 1332, but with a 44% rate in ABC range. So everybody else was DF and Ws. 
In math 0314, this is the large cohort going into college algebra, we expect that number to be slightly lower than in contemporary mathematics. 53% success rate versus 49% in math 1314, and math 0342, and math 1342. This is a fairly confined group of individuals who know what their major is. See that the numbers are higher at 59%, and Math 1342 at 70%, but also note that Math 0342 has an ABCDF scoring system. When we look at the grading system, where the pass-fail W system has been in place, you note that the numbers are higher, um, generally, than in Math 0342 when we exclude the D. Well, nobody thinks that Ds are great grades. I'm not arguing here they're great grades. What I'm saying is they're acceptable grades for completion so that the student can complete a college certificate or degree. We are not arguing they're brilliant mathematicians. But if we look at the difference in Math 1332, the D difference is 16%. In Math 1314, it is 12%. And even in Math 1342, it is 8%. If this is the last math class you're ever going to take and that D is successful, the numbers of students involved here is significant. This is just for the fall semester. Mr. Butler, how many students total are we talking about? Across all three courses, we're talking about an additional um, 146 students who would successfully complete. We are now looking at, so when we're looking at numbers with heart, I want you to understand that we have students who live in fear of those math <laughs> courses. Yeah. And if we can offer those students the opportunity in that course or in any other course that serves as a gateway to them, the opportunity in limited instances to offer them a pass-fail option from the day that they register through the last drop date potentially of the course, those students could elect to take a pass instead of worrying about an A, B, C, or D. And that 140 plus students is just with the D. We have students who live in fear of getting a B or a C in a course that becomes a gateway into their major's area. So I want you to know that we're considering implementing a pass, fail, and withdraw option for students in college level courses. And its purpose is to improve student success and student completion in college program completion by taking away the obstacle that's usually fear-based in the ABCD grading system. So we'll be looking into that. We'll bring that forward to you as we have more numbers to support it but we're very optimistic about where that might lead us. Do you have some questions about it? So it's not in effect now, but it will no. be... Okay, okay. We're going to talk about it's... it with the faculty and among the folks who need to be dealing with that in terms of state regulations, SACs, but we're fairly sure thus far that we're allowed to do it, and we want to make sure that we're doing it carefully and respectfully so that when a student should be getting an ABCDF grade, they are getting that grade, and it's affecting them positively toward their completion goals. Mm -hmm. But where it is not materially important, whether it's a passing grade or a letter grade, where will that help a student to achieve completion? Right. So we're very excited about that. Thank you. The other area we want to talk about quickly is the student evaluation of course and instructor. We had our first pass with our new student evaluation system that you so graciously helped us with. That's the one that's in with Beacon in the Campus Lab system. Some highlights here. The mean of the items scored on a five-point scale. Some highlights. We scored a 4.41 on instruction <coughs> that demonstrates the importance and significance of the subject matter. Our professors are teaching about the significance about what they're teaching, not just the subject. So that's pretty good. And a 4.38 in the rating of excellence of the instructor. Those are good numbers. Numbers we might want to work on. We definitely want to work on. A 3.51 in describing your progress on developing creative capacities. This isn't a surprise. Focus on critical thinking has often been on quantitative and empirical reasoning and less on creative thought. And so we know we have to work on that area. And 3.4, compare the difficulty of this course to others you have taken. That's an interesting one. It says that the course I'm evaluating is about on par with the others that I have taken. So we're going to look more into those numbers, and we're going to see more in, the, in our upcoming student evaluation of course and instructor. We looked at the idea average nationally. We knew this was going to happen. Part of the reason we wanted this system so we could compare ourselves to institutions mm -hmm. across the board. We scored an average one to three points below the national average on our overall outcomes in comparison. 
What that tells us is that we've implemented a new system. That system tells us about some values we had thought we known about before, but now we have quantitative information about it. And as we drill down into it, we can identify where we must improve. So this is the use of empirical data based on student evaluations to talk about what we are doing and what we can get better at. So this is a brief overview the aggregate stores of instruction on distribution of converted scores. So what this is, is looking at what the average is expected to be, that's that top gray bar, of distribution of student evaluations. And I've highlighted in blue, if you look, the excellence of the teacher is rated at higher 52% of the time by our students. That's a great thing. Excellence of course, 35%, much higher than expected as compared to 10. So we're doing very well at that. Where courses are working well and instructors are teaching them effectively for students, we are getting rated very highly. But if you look at the, left, the farthest column on the left-hand side, you'll notice that 26% rate courses much lower due to progress on relevant objectives. Where the student either doesn't understand the objective or doesn't understand how it relates to the relevance of what they're there to study, the student rates the course very low, and we see it correlating with a score of excellence of teacher and excellence of course that gives us a summary evaluation that's also on the low end scale. Overall, we're performing reasonably well. What this tells us is our split in students is more, more bimodal than we would like it to be. Students are either being very successful and rate their instructors and courses as very successful, but there are too many instances, for my taste, where the students are dissatisfied with the instruction and with the course, and that seems to relate to the relevance of the subject matter and their understanding of that. So these are areas that this tool is going to help us to work on. Are there any questions about the demand study information I've presented to you? If not, my last item to go over with you is the LVT program. We are in the process of bringing on board our new licensed vet tech instructor, she'll begin on March 4th. The development of the vet tech marketing program and vet tech website are underway. The application for the AVMA is currently in process. We plan to finish that next month. The surgical suite at the animal shelter is under construction, and the completion date right now is prospectively for the end of April, so we're looking forward to that. We've speak, spoken with Dr. Groffalo and Mr. Christie about the modifications to the Ag facility where we'll continue to teach the vet tech program. He's anticipating a cost of about $1,000 for the installation of the new sink. Hopefully that's all it is, but we'll do that this summer. We are talking with Dr. Groffalo and some outside agents to talk about where we can get the best deals on appropriate equipment for imaging and blood analysis. We'll need that equipment. But not all of it will be necessary in the first year, so we're talking about how we're going to include that in our upcoming budgets. And finally, we're expecting the program to become fully operational in fall of 2020. Are there any questions about the vet tech program and its, its plan? Now remind us, we, when we start in the fall, it's, it's year one. Only year one. Only year one. Our uh, advisory which, yeah. board has recommended <laughs> that we do not start both a freshman and sophomore cohort in the same year as it will overstress of the, and they'll sure. cause an immediate evaluation. Yeah. We want to make sure we get all of our ducks in a row and make everything working okay. well before that second, okay. that Thank compulsory you. evaluation. Thank you. Any questions? Any, any other questions? Thank you. All right, thank, thank you, you very much. For the update. Uh, Mr. Andy, can I say one thing about the Student Success Network that I uncovered that I think the board would find incredibly interesting? Um, I've been working on the quick reference for the faculty on the Student Success Network, and at first, it is an alert system that is the student is in trouble, we need to have some action on it, but it has two other things that I was really surprised to find out. One is a general update that anybody that is part of the Student Success Network can find out, maybe that a parent has passed away or some other little issue that may need to be addressed. And I think that that's all good information for anybody, a tutor, a faculty, anybody who comes across that information can submit that information. And I think that's also important. And then the, the other area that they can do as well as an alert is an encouragement. So they can simply do a kudos. Look how well you did on that English paper. You thought you could never write anything. Look how far you've gone. Um, I think that really goes to our culture of caring that we're trying to do. 
And I'm real excited that Beacon is going to allow us to do more than just, hey, I think the student's in trouble, encouraging them just a little bit at a time. And then that other piece of everybody be aware, this student may not be saying anything, but I found out they're in their financial trouble or their parent or their pet died, I don't know, you know, various updates Thank that you. they could do that can help them Thank be you. successful. So it's not just early alert, it's so much more good. and Beacon Thank can you. allow us to do that. It's from a board perspective, it is good to know that uh, we have helped invest in programs that are actually working uh, and, and connecting students in ways that have not been available from faculty, staff, and student perspectives before. That's Inter good to know. It's interconnected. It yes. really is a Thank network. you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So, agenda item eight, President Farmer, uh, you're going to talk to us about the board retreat? Uh, yes, Madam Chair. Just letting you know that uh, next month we'll be coming to you uh, to with planning information on the board <coughs> retreat. Uh, where we will be discussing board self-evaluation, evaluation of the president, and strategic planning. So please look for that to come uh, next month in March. I think that is. Board self-evaluation. Sounds interesting. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So uh, we have announcements from Crystal. This evening we have uh, a comedian, Ch Chinedu Naka. He actually has a bit about how his name doesn't get pronounced properly, and I'm sure I just butchered it. Uh, that is tonight. It's in the ALKEC at 7.30. And then tomorrow night, I know it says faculty voice recital. Actually, that is a lecture recital tomorrow night featuring Ronald Bennett. And then we have a whole slew of um, athletic games coming up, as you can see in your list there, basketball, softball, baseball. And then, as mentioned earlier, on February 27th and 28th, we'll, we'll be hosting the second annual interdisciplinary academic conference yeah. and we hope you will come and attend that <coughs> and then one thing not on your list that we'd like to invite you to is the workforce education department is going to be hosting an open house from four to six o'clock uh, today right after the meeting in room 208 of the void building you're invited to come attend and view the new laboratory and new equipment and learn more about their industrial maintenance and automation technology program that's being funded by a national science foundation grant Right, that's this afternoon. Yes, today. Later today, that's, thank you, Crystal. Okay, well, uh, item 10 is the closed session, um, and it should begin right about now. Um, Dr. Palmer, who do we need? Uh, Mr. Curley and I. And we will see the rest of you, hopefully, later. Thank you so much for attending. All right, we're... Going to call our meeting back into order. Uh, following discussion of the uh, agenda items listed in the closed session, there are no motions, no action required. So I would entertain a motion to adjourn. I so move. I'll second. And, and Trev seconds. And all in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank, right. thank, thank you, you very so much, much for waiting. Thank you. Your thank patience. You. Okay, a couple.